Hebrews the 11th chapter. Hebrews 11. Hey there. Hey. 27 through 29. 11, 27 through 29. This is the Moses model, part two. In fact, why don't we uh, review our way in just a little bit here. Go back to verse 23 from last week. By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child. And they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of, really, the deliverer, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. And now, today's text. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as though they were passing through dry land and the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. As you can see by your outline right there, we're pulling three points out of each one, or rather out of all those three verses. We're getting a point eat out each out of each verse. The Moses model today, like we're continuing with from last week, uh, moves us further into considering, okay, what about, what does the Holy Spirit want to teach me in regards to Moses' life and how he walked by faith? Because this is the by faith chapter, is it not? This is the by faith series within the series of Hebrews, and now I've got part two of a teaching within a teaching within a larger series. Could it get any more confusing? I can do it if you'd like. Rose Marie's looking at me like, <laughs> that was great, sis. <laughs> All right. And so in this arena, uh, once again, let me repeat to you that the author is not even dealing with the law issue because it's already been dealt with. He has spent those first 10 chapters just showing that Christ is greater, Christ fulfilled, and to go back into it, into the Mosaic standards, you know, is an act of the flesh, according to Hebrews 9, uh, verse 10, for instance. And so he's put all this aside right now, and now he's focusing on individuals who were around uh, prior uh, uh, to when the law was given, and of course given under Moses, given by God to Moses. And we're just going to touch on just a few after this of Uh, individuals who lived under law, but he's talking about the primacy of faith. The primacy of faith, which is pre-law, (laughs) post-law. It's faith, see? And so here, under the idea of the Moses model, we first discover in verse 27, uh, it says, by faith he left Egypt, that the Moses model here is a model that leaves. Not just simply leaves, but seriously forsakes and abandons. He leaves Egypt which is a type of the world, and we'll discuss that as we, as we go through this. Secondly, we discover that the Moses model is a model that keeps, and that's where we get into verse 28, by faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood. It's the idea of possessing a thing. He, he possesses the Passover, and really, uh, the Passover points us towards Christ because 1 Corinthians 5.7 says that Christ is our Passover. Not that we're to return to such a thing. Paul even makes that clear in 1 Corinthians 5, 8. But that Moses is pointing us, the Moses model, points us towards the Passover, the person of Christ, and the shedding, sprinkling, pouring of his blood. The Moses model always points us to Christ. Third and finally, then, it's a model that passes. And we see that in verse 29. By faith they pass through the Red Sea. A seemingly, of course, impossible scenario. If you were to put yourself in their sandals at that time, and you got the uh, Egyptian army and Pharaoh right on your back, and you got the Red Sea in front of you, and the hopelessness that you would be feeling, you know, and God says to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? I love that part of Exodus 14. Tell them to move forward. <laughs> Just tell them to move. And so, you know, the Lord then begins to do what he does and parting that Red Sea. See, a Moses model of faith passes through the sea of that circumstance. 
No matter how impossible it looks, and that's like, are you kidding me? No. Pass through it by faith. We'll discuss that as we move through these verses in particular right here. So let's start up with verse 27. This Moses model is a model that teaches us to leave, to forsake, to abandon. But forsake and abandon what? Verse 27. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. He katalepo Egypt. Uh, the word for leave is lepo in Greek. When you attach the prefix kata in front of a word, like lepo, what that does in this case is it intensifies the word. It doesn't always do that. Sometimes it points towards something going down. That's the feature of kata and the way that it, it's set within the grammar and the syntax of a passage. In this case, it intensifies this. Uh, when Moses left Egypt, and this is not discussing the first leaving, uh, where after we already uh, read about this earlier, when he came of age, he refused to become the son of Pharaoh's daughter, and then he realized, he found out somehow, that he was one of the Israelites. And then, of course, he murdered uh, that, uh, uh, that taskmaster, that Egyptian taskmaster, and it was known. And so he fled Egypt out of fear. That is not what this is talking about right here. This type of leaving is a different type of leaving altogether. Moses came into Egypt. He left Egypt the first time, 40 years on the backside of the desert by Mount Sinai, getting all of Egypt, if you will, out of him, 40 years, my gosh, meets the Lord Jesus at the burning bush. God assigns him the task of coming back into Egypt to deliver his people. He refuses the job. Notice he ends up going anyway, right? Just just don't. Just cave. Just, just know that he's got it and he'll do it for you. All right. But in any case, heads back into Egypt, a changed man, a different man. He had abandoned Egypt. We'll read about, you know, the ten times he had to confront Pharaoh, right? But he had to do it without fear. He left Egypt, he abandoned it, he forsook it. What is Egypt? It's a type of the world. So he's abandoning the world of those who are fallen in Adam and all the fruits and the results of that entire philosophy, that mindset. Uh, what the world says is practical many times is just evil, according to God's word. Depends on what it is that you're talking about. God's word is filled with uh, instructions that walking by faith means you do the opposite. If you want to go up, you go down. If you need to be provided for, then you better provide. You need to give it away, whether it's your faith, or your finances, your help, your assistance, uh, the word, it comes back to you. See, I, I love that passage in Ecclesiastes, cast your bread upon the water, waters and it will come back to you uh, in after a short amount of time. It's that picture right away of throwing something of value onto the surf and, and it takes it out, right? And then the tide, that is, and then it brings it back. That's the picture that's being, well, that's the walk by faith. Well, here, in order for him to be successful, in order for him to do the act of deliverer, which God had called him to do, we already saw that in verse 26, then he was going to have to abandon Egypt where? Up here and down here in his heart. It had to be completely grown. What do you think the 40 years in the backside of the desert was all about? It was getting Egypt out of him. And so he is forsaking this Egypt. You know, God calls us to do the exact same thing. 2 Corinthians 6, starting at verse 14. It's good to write down right there. 2 Corinthians 6, starting at verse 14, all the way to 7.1 says this, Don't be bound to get together with unbelievers. What partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Is there any? No. Any fellowship with light and darkness? No. How about harmony with Christ and the devil? Is there a harmony? Can they pitch a tune together? No. What has a believer in common with an unbeliever? And of course, it's all negatives. No, 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 no. Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of God, just as God had said, I will dwell in them, walk among them. I'll be their God. They'll be my people. Therefore, come out from among them, from their midst, and be separate. Separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. In other words, fellowship can be there. 
I will be a father to you. You shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Now, 7-1. Therefore, having these promises, the promises he just read, Beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Defilement of flesh and spirit. You know, your spirit, that's your mind, according to Paul in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 2, verse uh, 14, and, or rather, verses 11 through 14, uh, through 16, rather, speaks of that. So cleanse, get the world out, get the Egypt out. You look back at this text right here in Hebrews 11, 27, and we see that Moses is leaving Egypt, and especially talking about the aspect of him leaving Egypt after the ten plagues. You can make a note of Exodus 12, verses 40 through 41. Exodus 12, 40 through 41 speaks about how that when he left Egypt, after he had been confronting Pharaoh those ten times, he didn't just go by himself. He went with some two and a half, maybe more million people, all physical ethnic descendants of Abraham. When one leaves Egypt, when you leave Egypt, the idea is that you take individuals with you. The end of Jude, uh, Jude's little book says, save those like pulling, save people like pulling them out of the fire, but pull them out. What is your Egypt, by the way? You got a personal Egypt? Something that you need to leave? Maybe it's an Egypt in your mind. Maybe it's something that you live with. I don't know. Uh, but is it a real Egypt? Is it is it the world and the world structure that has such a hold on you that it just disables you from being able to think Christ's thoughts after him? What's your Egypt? And when you leave, are you leaving on your own? Or is it your intention that when you leave this Egypt, you're going to see others delivered just like Moses was the deliverer, called to be the deliverer, are you going to deliver others? These guys I play with uh, out there in the old music world, I, I got several of them I'm working on. I'm pulling them out of that Egypt. Not me, per se, but, but that's the attitude we're to have. The Moses model tells us to abandon, forsake Egypt. And when you depart, depart with the spoils, with those whom God sends to you. Make sure you depart, by the way. Not only are we to leave the world behind, but we're also to leave something else behind in this verse, and that's leave fear behind. It says in verse 27 that by faith he left Egypt not fearing the wrath of the king. It's, I, I already mentioned the, the, the ten confrontations. There probably were more, but ten we know of relative to uh, the book of Exodus, which were in regards to those ten plagues. And every time he stepped forward, he had to confront him, but he had to do it without fear. This is somebody completely different. Forget the Yul Brenner thing, by the way. You know, the movie. Forget, forget that. Let's stick to the Bible. I know that's all very interesting in Easter time or whatever they show that thing. But I'm sorry, he's he just he's he's not he's not Pharaoh. It's not working for me. And uh, but I don't know uh, who played uh, Moses. Who? Charles? No, the other guy. See, that's how impressed I was. It was Charlton Heston. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know about that. We're talking about a man without fear, a man of faith who confronted this king, who could have taken him out with a thought, with a whisper, with a snap of his finger. God had to do something with him for 40 years in the backside of the desert. He had to get all that Egypt out of him. Now, if you're still walking around with Egypt in you, you're just not going to be of any use to the Lord. You really aren't. You can't be halfway in and halfway out. You have to be all in on this process, this faith process. If you're all in on this faith process, God will continue with delivering you from Egypt out of the inside of you during your little back time, backside out of the backside of the desert, 40 years less, more, I don't know. One of the things that has got to go is this fear thing confronting him every time. Look, Psalm 27, this is fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. You can just write this stuff down. I'll read them to you. Psalm 27, verses 1 through 3. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers come upon me to devour my flesh, 
My adversaries, my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war arise against me in spite of all of this, I shall be confident. (laughs) If the Lord is my light and my salvation, there is no fear. There is no one to fear. There is no thing to fear. How about Matthew 10.28? You guys probably already know this one. Don't fear him who uh, can uh, kill the body and after that can't do anything more. Rather, fear him, the Lord God, who after kills can take both spirit, or rather soul and body, and chuck it into hell. So we get our fear priorities right. But, but if the guy, all the guy can do is just send you on your way to the Lord, that's all he can do. Don't fear, man. I mean, it, and we know this, but it's like we have to repeat it to ourselves. That You know why, what you're doing when you're repeating that to yourself? You're getting Egypt out of you, and you're getting you out of Egypt. Matthew 10, 28. Romans 8, 15, personal favorite of uh, one of the elders here. Romans 8, 15. I love how Paul states this about fear. He says, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, whereby we cry out what? Good, good, good. Abba, Father. Daddy, my daddy. There is no fear. You have not received fear again. Did you notice how he put it that way? Not received it again. Because according to Hebrews 2.15, which we've already looked at, we looked at it last week, that after the Lord Jesus Christ became flesh and blood, took upon him the nature of man, became flesh and blood, that he destroyed the works of the devil and delivered us from that fear that he used to use to enslave us all our lives, but no more. See how, see how the word does more than just say, do not fear. It tells you why you don't have to fear. Why fear is an obsolete thing for the believer in Christ. See? I love this stuff. 1 Peter 3.14 is another great one for you to write down. In this realm of fear, as we consider how the Moses model pushes us, delivers us, and tells us why we need to abandon the Egypt and the fear thing, it says, but even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed, and do not fear their fear, and do not be troubled. Do not fear what they fear, those who persecute you. See, all who live in Egypt are filled with fear, and those who promote some sort of, you know, I'm not afraid of anything sort of a thing, or you need to be afraid of me, they're the ones who are more afraid than anything else. Or anyone else, for that matter. First John 4.18 says that those who have been perfected in love do not fear. Now, that's a positional thing. You have been perfected in the love of Christ. Now, it's working itself out in you relative to behavior. But First John 4.18 says those who fear have not been perfected yet in that love. No need to fear. You shall not fear the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, or the destruction that wastes at new day. A thousand from that destruction may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. What are you afraid of? Only with your eyes shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked, which is destruction coming upon them. Back to Hebrews 11. Well, you're probably still there, right? So by faith he left, he abandoned, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. You can't do this job of deliverer and be afraid. But there's something else he had to leave behind, and that is the spiritual blindness. Leaving blindness behind relative to who he was going to keep his eye on, who he was going to constantly see. Because the end of verse 27 tells us exactly how he was able to do this. For he endured as seeing him who is unseen. Kartereo is our Greek there for endure. It means, endure is good. Uh, It means to persist in a thing. 
uh, to persevere in a thing. I like this. Some lexicons say this, to hold up a thing, to hold it up, uh, to be obstinate. I like that too. To be obstinate in seeing him who is unseen, to be obstinate about a thing. See, Paul was teaching the Corinthians to be obstinate in their work against Egypt when he said, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know that your labor in the Lord is not what in the Lord? Vain, which means empty, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to bring forth fruit. It's going to bring forth results. That's an obstinance. Well, Moses had this obstinance. What a pain in the backside he must have been to Pharaoh. He just keeps coming back. Pain in the backside. Keeps coming back again and again and again. Pharaoh keeps changing his mind. Okay, I'll let him go. And then he changes his mind. But he keeps coming back. Moses had to endure Pharaoh's threats and vacillations. Uh, the frog thing. Here comes the frogs, right? In Exodus 8, verses 8 through 15, speaks about that. Exodus 8, 8 through 15. Pharaoh said, okay, I'll let him go. Then he saw that the little bodies of the froggies were left after the, the mayhem, and he changed his mind. Vacillated. Here come the insects. Again, chapter 8, verses 25 through 32. And once again, Pharaoh backs out on his word after saying he let him go. Even Pharaoh's death threat to Moses, Moses had to endure. He had to be obstinate in faith seeing him who is unseen. In Exodus 10, verse 28 through 29, Pharaoh says, after the ninth plague, he says, get out. Next time you see my face, you're going to die. And Moses says right back to him, you're right. I'm never going to see your face again. He spoke prophetically about that because of what was coming after the tenth plague. What was Moses' model to us in regards to how he endured? Well, it's the balance of this verse. Bottom of verse 27, it says he saw him who is unseen. Now, we know God is not seen. We, we've been through the passages in regards to that. There is not some um, you know, a, a, a literal sight way to see God other than if he chooses to reveal like he did with Moses in Exodus 32, I'll put you in this cleft of the mountain after Moses said, show me your glory. He said, well, nobody can see my face and live. So we want you to live a little while longer. No uh, exploding on the side of the rock right here and making a giant mess. So uh, I'll stick you in this cleft of the rock, put my hand up against you. God doesn't have hands. God is spirit. And yet he is not without form. There is spiritual formation there, but he's not carbon-based. He's not physical relative to you and I. Carbon-based body, flesh and bones, but he does have form. He is not without form. Deuteronomy 4, 12, and 15 says that he does have form. But he's spirit, like angels are spirits. But they have form. They have physicality. They have created bodies. But God the Father does not have a body. See, this is what God the Son uh, set aside, according to Philippians 2, 5 through 7, in the uh, <coughs> ekonosis, the emptying out of all of his divine prerogatives. He retained his divinity, but he set prerogatives aside when he took on flesh and blood and was found in fashion as a man, but without the fallenness in Adam. Um, he could be seen now because he's in this body. That's why Jesus was able to say, uh, Philip, what do you mean show us the Father and it'll be enough? Uh, have I been with you so long you still don't know who I am? What's the rest of it? He, very good. He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say show us the Father? John 1.18 says in the Greek that Jesus came in order to bring the Father out from behind the curtain and put him on display. That's John 1.18. So Jesus is displaying the Father. We learn, we're learning throughout John's Gospel, um, especially in the fifth chapter, which we're trying to get through right now on Wednesday nights, which will might be done with this, this coming Wednesday. But we're learning that Jesus only did the things he what? He saw the Father do, only said the things he 
heard the Father say. This intimacy, this keeping your eyes on Jesus, right? That's part of this too that we're going with. He, Moses, saw him who is unseen. Now seeing right there, that word, that's arao again, which we've already understood that the writer of the Hebrews loves that word. And it means that experiential type of thing. He never really uses it in Hebrews in regards to physical sight. Like I see Kathy right now. I see Jen and I see Tony and I see Larry boldly sitting here in the front row. See? Yeah, well, I'm trying to make all my big gesticulations this way towards the door, brother. But it's actually, so Moses was not seeing him in the, in the or, or, or oracular way. He was seeing him relative to experience, non-physical sight. Orao here is the present tense form of the verb. So it's habitual, forward motion, continuous. He was always seeing him who was unseen. I love this. If you want to endure, you must habitually, regular, be seeing, knowing, experiencing him. Do you? Do you? Do you? Is that your practice? Because otherwise, if you don't, you're going to hang out in Egypt. You're never going to get out of Egypt. Unless it's your practice to, for instance, see everything through Christ's eyes. See him and everything through his eyes, like Hebrews 12, 2 says, which we haven't gotten to yet, but I will comment on fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Drilling them, cementing them in, bolting them down through habit, through daily time in the Word, daily time singing to him psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Every time the door is open in the church, be here. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Time in prayer. As you are driving, as you are laying down, as you're on your knees before him, however you do it, fix the eyes on Jesus. This is how you do it. This is how you do it. This is how you leave Egypt. This is how you become the Moses model of the deliverer. This is how you bring others out of Egypt as you leave Egypt. See, That's your life. That is every believer's life. I just summarized the whole thing. That's it. Eyes on Jesus, leaving Egypt, taking others with you. That's your life. Boil it all down. I like Psalm 25, verse 15 for this. Psalm 25 and verse 15 in this idea of keeping our eyes on him and the benefits to that. Psalm 25, 15 says, My eyes, David says, are continually towards the Lord. Are continually towards the Lord. Why? Because the next part says, For he will pluck my feet out of the net. That's why he's getting his deliverance. That's why he's getting his feet plucked out of the net. Of course, the net being that which has trapped him, like an animal would be trapped, like a bird would be trapped. But you're not going to get out if your eyes are suddenly on the trap instead of on the Lord. So he says, my eyes will continuously be towards the Lord because that's how I get out of the trap. Psalm 19 and verse 8 speaks in the same way. Ephesians 1, verse 18. That the, Paul says, here's my prayer for the Ephesians, that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened. That they may know then what is the hope of their calling. And so on. See everything through Christ's eyes. He, how did Moses do it? How did he stand in front of Pharaoh? Obstinately. How did he endure? Obstinately. He kept seeing him who is unseen. Well, we move then from this idea of this model that leaves, leaves Egypt, abandons it, to now, secondly, a model that keeps. We see that in verse 28. By faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. Poieo is our Greek word for kept here, to keep. Um, that's okay, but performed might be better. It has the idea of accomplishment, poieo, uh, working right here, that Moses, Moses performed, accomplished the Passover. He did this by faith because the angel of death was what? Passing over. See, I gave it to you and you could have just filled that in. But, 
but, but we missed that. So we'll come back to that. We'll try that again at some point. All right. Uh, I want you to hold your spot right here in, in Hebrews 11 and slip over to Exodus 12 for a moment. Exodus 12. <clears throat> And let's see what the heck this means. This Passover scenario. This is preparation for the final tenth plague, which is the angel of death, yes? Exodus 12, verses 11 through 13, says this, God summarizing, Now you shall eat the Passover lamb in this manner. Watch. <clears throat> With your loins girded, so belt on, shoes on your feet, sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. This is not a sit-down affair. I'm taking you out of Egypt. I will go through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, against, watch, against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgments. I am the Lord, not them, is the implication. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. Remember, putting it on the doorpost. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. I will pass over you, and no plague shall befall you to destroy you. When I strike the land of Egypt, I guess we better get the heck out of Egypt. When I see the blood, there is something else that's corresponding to what we're dealing with right here. Now, just keep your hand right here in Exodus 12, and now you can kind of flip back to Hebrews 11. I just want you to have Exodus available for uh, another moment or two here in regards to this. Now, this is talking about the true Passover, which I've already said to you is Christ. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5, verses 6, 6 through 8 is speaking about Christ as our Passover in the context of, remember, there was a man in the Corinthian church uh, who was having sexual relations with what appears to be um, his stepmother or something along these lines. Dad is not around, and he's got this relationship going, and the rest of the Corinthians are thinking, well, this is pretty cool because look how free we are, you know, blah, 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 blah. And Paul is just livid. He says, livid. This guy has been rebuked. Now he needs to go. And so he says, you boot him out. That's what he means, excommunicating, when he says, turn him over to Satan. It means excommunication. It doesn't mean hand him over to the literal devil. But it's the idea of the world is represented by Satan, that, and he's using the same kind of terminology that would have been used and understood in the first century. And then he uses this analogy. He says, he says because you've got to get the leaven out. Got to get the leaven out and be a new lump without leavening. For Christ, our Passover, is sanctified or has been sacrificed for you. Notice how he brings all this together just like that, the whole Passover narrative. It's Christ, our Passover. Christ is not only the Passover lamb, Christ is the angel of death. Because God said, I will pass over you. Well, who is God? Well, Jesus is. Jesus is the Passover lamb. Jesus came to reveal the Father. He said he was God. That doesn't mean the Father isn't around. It means that they are one. They are unified. John the 17th chapter. May they be one just like you and I, Father, are one and the same. John uh, uh, chapter 5 verse 14 uh, speaks about the fact that Jesus and the Father are equal. Isos in Greek. They are the same. And so on and so forth. For Christ our Passover is slain. So this model that Moses gives us is that which keeps or accomplishes or performs the Passover, which means keeping your eye on Christ because Christ is our Passover. So we keep the true Passover, but also in verse 28 we find that we're keeping the true blood as well where he says he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood. Um, Proscusis is our Greek for sprinkling. You know, it means to pour. Pouring. It means a pouring. Now that's important. Because Isaiah 53, 12 says that in that prophecy about Christ dying on the cross, says that he poured out his life for those who came to pour it out for. He poured out his life, Isaiah 53, 12. Psalm 22, 14, another prophecy uh, psalm about Christ and his work on the cross 
says that his life is poured out from him. Psalm 22, verse 14. In Matthew 26, you're writing all this down, right? Because there will be a test. Matthew 26 and verse 28, Jesus speaks about he came to pour out his life, a ransom for the many. He does it again in Luke 22 and verse 20. And he speaks about the fact in those passages in regards to the Passover celebration, which he turns into, he changes and turns into himself. And he says, my blood is the new covenant, which is what? Poured, yes? Poured out for many. And so here, right here, in Hebrews 11:28, when he kept the fat Passover and the sprinkling of blood, the proskusis, the pouring out of blood, uh, Christ eliminated on the cross his blood. When the body was buried, I mean, there really was no five quarts of blood. The blood was gone. We've already seen earlier in the ninth chapter of Hebrews, verse 12, uh, all the way through 24, I believe it is, that Christ then took his blood when he let his spirit depart, dismissed his spirit, right? After the victory statement, it is finished, the debt is paid, and he released his spirit. Hebrews 9 talks about the fact that at that moment, Jesus takes his blood and offers it up to God. I don't know how it happened. I don't just tell you what the text says satisfied God's righteous requirement at that moment for all the elect, past, present, and future. And that's why what in the temple was rent into? The veil which stopped men from having access to God. That veil was rent at that moment. What's up with this? All I can do is stand back and just be in awe. Amazing stuff. He pours out his life, it says. The sprinkling of blood, really the pouring of blood. Notice back in verse 28, he kept the Passover and the pouring out of the blood, which is the blood of Christ, so that, result clause, so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. God said he would go through the land of Egypt. He would pass through the land of Egypt. He does it through his angel, but it's still him doing it. It's his action. He who destroyed the firstborn. Why would God destroy the firstborn? Because of the sin. The being fallen in Adam and the on a national scale, the resistance to his will that was demonstrated by Pharaoh in particular by saying, no, 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 I'm not letting him go, I'm not letting him go. The depth of this sin. And so it requires destruction. The word for destroy right there is holothruo. Got to be careful with that. Holothruo. Literally, to cause to perish. Freiburg's Greek lexicon. I got a zillion of them. Um, I'm pointing them out to you. Freiburg's lexicon really stands out in speaking about this word meaning to cause to perish. Now that's important. To perish. To cause to perish. It says here that the necessity of the pouring out of the blood, it was necessary so that he who caused to perish the firstborn, remember that was the tenth plague, <clears throat> would not touch them. The result being is that this blood had to be poured out or there would be perishing. Does this sound familiar to you? I'm thinking John 3... 60, right? And 1028, it says the same word right there. God so loved the world of the believer, according to the context, that he gave his only begotten son, his one unique son, so that all who believe in him would not perish, cause to perish, but have everlasting life. John 1028 says the same thing. All those whom the Father gives to me, Jesus said, yeah, will not perish. Second Peter 3.9 also uses the same word. So you see, all of this is pointing us towards Christ. But if you didn't have the New Testament, you wouldn't see that all this was happening in Exodus. But here, the writer to the Hebrews, 11.28, is bringing all this out right here. 
so that he who destroyed, caused to perish the firstborn, would not touch them. Oigano is our Greek word for touch right there. Would not touch them. It's a word that means to touch with hostility. Not simply touch. He's touching me, he's touching me. No. <laughs> it means to touch with hostility. Why does he use that word? Prior to regeneration, we are hostile to God. We are enemies of God. That's why he uses that word. Those are the only people whom he saves. He saves those who are his enemies by sin. Uh, I'll let you, I, I've decided to let you go. I'm setting you free now from Exodus. Your hand can now be free. Pull it out. And now, <laughs> Romans 5, listen to this. Romans 5, verses 9 and 10. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the God who is just ticked off, but maybe he can be talked out of it. No. We shall be saved from the wrath of God. God is wrathful. That's not a popular thing to preach, but he is, and it has to be preached. He's wrathful because we don't understand the depth of the Adamic fall. We don't get it. That's why we come up with screwball doctrines like, you know, you can believe on your own and choose to be saved or not be saved, and God just loves everybody. And blah. People who say God loves everybody don't understand the biblical teaching of the depth of the Adamic fall. God loves his elect savingly. There is a general kind of love in that God sends the rain and the sunshine and people are able to eat his food even though they're his enemies. But there's a wrath of God. Now watch, verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. See, God reconciles enemies, not good people, not people who are trying to do the right thing. No. Ah! He reconciles enemies through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. He is always the mediator. See, 1 Timothy 2.5, there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Christ will ever be eternally the mediator. And he mediates and we remain saved by his life. Yes, God is satisfied by his blood. But he raised Christ, one reason, to mediate for us forever. Jesus ever lives, Hebrews 7.25 says, he ever lives to intercede for us. His life intercedes for us. It's not about him on his knees in front of the Father. It's the fact that he's alive, that he's been raised. He ever lives. If Christ didn't come out of that tomb, then now it's amplified for you, like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, we are all, of all men, most miserable. We are perished. Those who have died in Christ, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 15, they perished, they're lost. If Christ didn't rise from the dead, And he did that for enemies. All elect are enemies. All elect of God are enemies. Not elect just stay enemies. That's all. Ah, uh, this model that keeps keeping the true Passover, keeping the true bud, finally leads us to third and finally. A model that passes. <laughs> verse 29, by faith. Like this, every verse. By faith, by faith, by faith. Now, remember what I told you? The Greek doesn't have the word by in front of faith. It's just faith. Faith, faith, faith. It's like, you know, have you heard this enough yet? It's like faith, 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 faith. The by idea is for English sake. I kind of like it without the word by. If I was to do a translation, I'd dump it. I, I like it this way. That's probably why I shouldn't do a translation, because there's probably a better reason for it, and I just don't care for it. Faith! They pass through the Red Sea as though they were passing through dry land. And the Egyptians, when they attempted it, <laughs> were drowned. Passing through by faith, resulting in deliverance. Now, I'll just have you write this down because it's taking, 
take up too much time. Exodus 14, verses 13 through 15. Exodus 14, verses 13 through 15, and then 21 through 22. By faith, they passed. Here they go. Egyptians on their backside. Red Sea in front of them. God intervenes. He gets in between them, the, the Egyptians coming, and the Israelites there at the Red Sea, and he gets in between them and stops them, and then he causes an east wind to blow all night long. Could God have just done it like that? Sure, he didn't. But in his providence, he chose a different way. Sometimes you need time to get your eyes open to see the provision that God is making. And if he just does it, you won't even know it's God. Did you ever stop to think about that? I, I, I have to think about that. But I need time to appreciate and understand it's my Father working. Just heal me. Bang. Just like that. But I need time to know it's my Father working. Oh, trust me. If I got healed, just like that, I would know it's my... Would you? Really? Would you? I don't know. Maybe. Or maybe your brain would start going, ah, that Tylenol would have worked anyway, so... There's that subtle thing that goes on, that... That rampant desire to not believe, even in the believer, we're kind of a contradiction in terms. We are. And so, all night long, this east wind is blowing, and it's creating something. And it's looking like, wait a minute, there's like dry ground. And when the text says in Exodus, you'll read it, that the Israelites crossed on dry ground, that means there were dust clouds. God sucked it all up. Wall of water on the right, wall of water on the left. God says to, to Moses, why are you talking to me? Tell them to go move forward. Stick your staff out there and I'm going to do this. And so they began to do it. But they had to go by the face of faith of Moses. Moses was driving this ship because he was the one with faith. The people were going, why did you take us out of Egypt? We should have just stayed by the fish pots and ate the garlic and ate the onions. And yeah, we were slaves, but at least we... Shut up! See, people who are delivered... All believers at some point, if not for most of their lives, unfortunately, just end up being spiritual whiners. They're just whining all the time. Why is it this way? I get a minute. I'm sorry. I know you don't do that. You know I don't do that. That's what we do. The Red Sea circumstance has come for some will come for others, and is in fact going to come again. You can plan on it. You can plan on it. The desperation, the I need deliverance, the I can't go forward, I can't go back. I have to have God intervene. And what, the way he does this is fascinating. The way he makes you, inter, he, the way he makes you stand for this is fascinating because what's, what's about to happen right here, I kind of got to hit the gas a little bit here. It says, by faith, they passed, passed through the Red Sea. A diabeno is our Greek word for passed. Diabeno. Now, I'm going to take this directly from the Liddell and Scott lexicon. Normally, I don't do this. I just tell you definitions. I don't tell you where I get them. You know, you're trusting me that I do, in fact, look these up, and I'm not just making them up. But maybe you shouldn't. You never know. I could be wrong. I could be gone. I could be taking you on a whirlwind cruise into nonsense. No, not Kelly. Yes, why not? Uh, I'm not, but just maybe I pushed a little too hard on that one a little bit. All right, watch. This word passed. It says they passed through the Red Sea, the Abeno. This is fascinating. Liddell and Scott point out that this word is primarily used of an individual who stands with both heels dug into the ground with his legs spread apart to stabilize him. Okay, Stabilizing him. Standing with the legs apart. It's the idea of to plant oneself firmly while fighting. While engaging. Well, this is Ephesians 6. Having done all to stand... Stand, therefore, and then he describes, with the helmet of salvation, with the sword of the Spirit, with your feet uh, 
preparation of the gospel of peace, so on and so forth. It's the same word right here. How did they pass through the Red Sea? What was their attitude in getting through the Red Sea? Feet firmly planted. Determination. There's that word obstinance again that we saw earlier. That was the only other way they were going to get across. Think about it for a second. You know, how, how high do you figure this water was? Pretty darn high. The wall here, the wall there. And you've got to fight against that fear, you know, that flight thing, right, uh, of what if I obey God and it all comes crashing in on me? What if? And the more you do that, the more you're living in Egypt. You still don't have that stinking address in Egypt out of you yet. It's still there. Likely or less likely to move forward in faith if you go, what if? Likely or unlikely? Unlikely, less likely, more than likely, you're not going. You're not going. That required some faith. But it required a faith that put both feet firmly, obstinately, planted, ready to engage, as it were. In other words, there's determination, and they went with that determination. If nothing else, I'd have to force my way. I'd have to force it. Yes, sometimes faith and the action thereby, the faith that you have and then the verb faith, right, the act of faith, not the fact of faith, remember that? Okay? You just got to force it. You either believe it and you're there or you're not. Now, Forcing it doesn't mean doesn't mean fearfully forcing it. There is still the abs- aspect of the biblical uh, form of verb faith that acts in a state of peace and confidence. That's what the verb means, beastus. It means confidence, a confidence, a knowing of a thing. And so they passed both feet firmly planted, right? Through the Red Sea. They were obstinate. I'm going through. I'm not going around. I can't go over it. I'm going through it. God always takes you through it. But 1 Corinthians 10, He will not test you beyond that which you are able to bear, but will with the test make a way of escape so you can bear up under it. In other words, if, you, if you're encountering the test and it's difficult and it feels like too much, I, more than I can bear, that text already told you, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that if God's doing it, if you're being tested, and you're going through it, then you can bear up under it. It's not too much for you to bear. Because he says he doesn't give you something more than you can bear. But he tells you how to bear it. Not through flesh, not through positive thinking, but through the living word of God. By faith, you stand. By faith, you go through. By faith! which unfortunately the Egyptians didn't have, bottom of verse 29, and the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. See, people of the world are not able to receive God's deliverance. You know why? People of the world are not able to receive God's deliverance because it requires God's faith, and he doesn't give it. All they knew was charge in there. Where was their quarry? Down on the other side now, because God, uh, pillar of fire, he had to lift, because he was standing between you know, the Israelites and the Egyptians, holding the Egyptians back so the Israelites could go, holding uh, the Egyptians, the world back, so the Israelites could realize, yes, it is open all the way across, because it takes some time to realize what God has done for you. It takes some time to understand that, so that you can act. And God's holding the rest back. But then, he got his people, if you will, the type of the church, the elect, leaves Egypt. He gets them all the way out, and now it's time to deal with the non-elect. And now it's time to deal with the non-elect enemies of God. And now it's time to loose, finally, the absolute necessity that is based upon the holiness that is God, and bring forth Righteous vengeance. And with that bugs you, and if that, I don't think it bugs you, but anybody who's listening to my voice, and if that makes you want to gravitate towards, oh, God doesn't throw people into hell, and oh, hell, the lake of fire can't be eternal, you know, and oh, God just puts people out of their misery, and I can't serve a God like that, once again, 
And if you're a Christian who believes that, you have the faintest, foggiest idea of the depravity and depth of the Adamic fall and how it passed on to absolutely every one of us. I just read something from some Christian preterist wingding the other day. And I'm speaking as a preterist, Preterists are some of the n numbest people on the planet. They're, they do some of the worst theological work and have some of the worst abilities of anybody I've seen out there. I got universalists out there that do better work in the text than some preterists. They come up with some of the most errant nonsense that is out there. Just get on Facebook and check it out. Sorry, segue. I'm back now. Look, look, look at this. It says those who, the Egyptians, when they attempted it, when they tried it, they were drowned. I, I'm going to read this to you and then conclude. Uh, you can make a note of it. It's where I was going to have you be, meet me, I think. But it's Exodus 14. You don't need to go there. Just listen to me. Exodus 14, verses 23 through 30. Then the Egyptians took up the pursuit, and all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, his horsemen, went in after them into the midst of the sea. At the morning rot, watch, the Lord looked down on the army of the Egyptians. Now that's bad for them. When God looks at one who is uncovered, no blood, blood of the lamb, and looks on them, then it's judgment time. God must judge. Here we go. The Lord looked down on the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and the cloud and brought the army of the Egyptians into confusion. This is why we have... Uh, you know, a, a president that brings lesbians and gays into the White House, throws a party for them, he's confused. God is looking on him. The judgment has begun. I hope some of you who can't make the first service do listen to the Amos teachings. And he brought them into confusion. 25, he caused their chariot wheels to swerve. Oh, my God's a good God. He didn't go, ah, ah, ah. Caused their chariot. The Hebrew actually is better translated. He calls the wheels to come off. Because he's going to waylay them in the middle of the Red Sea so he can get them all. Well, that's not my God. Caused the chariot wheels to come off. He made them drive with difficulty. That's an understatement. So the Egyptians said, First wise thing they ever said. Let us flee from Israel, for the Lord is fighting for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, oh, he's going to make Moses complicit in this now. The world says this makes Moses a murderer. Okay. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so the waters may come back over the Egyptians, over their chariot and their horsemen. Now, that was on Moses. Sometimes God requires us to do things that the world would, would absolutely castigates us for. Now, I'm not saying go out and hurt somebody. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying when you deliver this kind of information, the world does not dig it because the world loves its own. And like Christ said to the disciples, you're not of this world. If you were, the world would love you because the world loves its own. That's why they love the Dalai Lama. Dalai Lama. I could do something. They, it's why they, they love these guys. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal state at daybreak while the Egyptians were fleeing right into it. Then the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, even Pharaoh's entire army that had gone into the sea after them, not even one of them remained. But the sons of Israel walked on dry land through the midst of the sea, and the waters were like a wall to them on their right hand and to their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Bottom of 29 in Hebrews 11, when the Egyptians attempted it, they were Drown. Katapeno in Greek. It means to drink down. To drink down. Let me summarize this fast. 
like the three points teach us, so let me give you a, a three-point summarization and ask you some questions. The Moses model, first of all, teaches us to leave behind, abandon Egypt, the world, fear, and spiritual blindness. Because remember, Moses endured as seeing him who was unseen. He saw. The Moses model teaches us to abandon Egypt, the world, fear, and spiritual blindness. Have you? Do you still? Maybe you need to do some more abandoning, but that's between you and the Lord. But I'm telling you, you won't make it, and you won't be able to be uh, the new creation in Christ that you are without abandoning Egypt. What kind of Egypt is still in your life? You know. You know. How much longer are you going to play around in there? How much longer? So the Moses model teaches us to abandon that. Secondly, the Moses model teaches us to keep the true Passover, which is Christ. Not stay back in the mosaic structure and then the types and the signposts, but in Christ himself, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. For Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. There's the Moses model. Stresses that. The pouring out of the blood of Christ. I have determined to know nothing among you, Paul says to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2, except Jesus Christ and Him what? Crucified. Thirdly, the Moses model teaches us to pass through the impossible looking Red Sea of circumstance with an attitude of planting your feet firmly getting ready to fight for that faith. That's how you get through. That's how you, plan, that's how you get through. No matter what the Red Sea circumstance is. There's no other way around it. Paul said in Ephesians 6, having done all to stand, what's left to do? Keep on standing. And you wait on him for that deliverance. One of the things that Moses said to the people of Israel at that moment, at that circumstance, stand still and the Lord will fight for you. And that's when God went back, pillar of fire, went back behind the Israelites and stopped the Egyptians from getting any closer, giving them time. Could have wiped them out right then. He could have wiped out the Egyptians right then. Why didn't he? Because the, Israel would never have known. He would never, they would never have had that demonstration. Why is it so hard that you're going through what it is right now, whatever it might be? Because that's the only way you can know how great your Savior is, how great your Deliverer is. There is no other way. The circumstance must be tough. The heat must be hot to know who it is that is delivering you out of that and how powerful He is and how great He is. That's the only way. That is the only way. Well, Father, today we humble our hearts deeply before you. And we ask in Jesus' name that you would cause this model, Lord, that's in these three verses, to be active in our lives. Lord, help us to not hang around in Egypt anymore. Let's not take the weekend for Egypt and live in the kingdom the other days. Let's not do that, Lord. Convict us, Lord, where we need conviction, where you would put your finger on that area of sin, that address in Egypt that maybe we keep going back to. You put that, you put your finger on us in regards to that. Convict and convince us and give us thy gift of repentance, Lord, to forsake and abandon that. Lord, thank you for doing that in our life. Keep us focused on the blood of Christ. Keep us focused on the fact, Lord, that the Red Sea impossibility, Lord God. You are able to deliver us. We don't need to be afraid of that. You'll glorify yourself. And you'll show us your deliverance, Psalm 91, verse 16 says. Let that be so, O Lord. Lord, we humble ourselves before you. We praise and thank you for all that you have taught us today, Lord God. Through this imperfect vessel, Lord, glorify thyself through thy Son in every way. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.